In the last video, we talked about the ideas, the historical perspectives that led to the atom. And so in this video, we are going to talk about the scientists who are credited with discovering the atom. So the work that we're going to talk about today really is bound under these scientists or is accredited to these scientists. Now, many of these scientists led teams, J.J. Thompson, Robert Milliken, and Henry Baccarat, Yuri Curie, and Pierre Curie, and Ernest Rutherford. Many of these are scientists who worked with grad students or other perspectives, and these are credited with these discoveries. So many of these discoveries were completed over 100 years ago. So we know that there are electrons. But the real question is, what led J.J. Thompson to discovering that there were electrons? In 1897, J.J. Thompson, shown here on the right, he's a British scientist and he was studying cathode rays. And so a cathode ray is essentially an evacuated tube, meaning a tube under vacuum, where we have it filled with a gas of some variety and it's connected to a volt source. And so what we see is that we have a negative and a positive charge applied across this voltmeter what we're gonna generate is what's gonna be called a cathode ray. So he was studying these and looking at cathode rays created from different types of anodes. So that would be the, well, in this case, it would be the cathode, which is the negative portion. And so what he was looking at is how these cathode rays moved in different capacities. So in addition to applying voltage, he created this cathode ray and exposed it to a magnetic field. So if we were to draw a second cathode ray tube, where we again have the ability to create cathodes, oops, that should be a positive sign. And so what we actually see is the ability to create a cathode and then study it by adding a magnet north and south. And it turns out on the other sides, we had additionally and different electric field. And so the question became, what happened when we applied these cathode rays? The cathode rays functioned through here. So what they noticed is when you turned on the north pole or the magnet, we saw a shift and we could see them go up or we could see the cathode rays shift and go down. And so in other drawings of this that you may have seen, there's a much larger detector shown on the right. So what this deflection told him is that the movement of the ray, the movement of the ray in response to the applied field it suggests a negative particle. And in other courses, they'll talk about this more in depth and in other videos. The thing is that when you adjust the magnetic strength or the electric strength, the particle moves in a way that is indicative of a negative particle, i.e. it is repelled by an increase in negative charge and it is affected in the magnetic field as well. And so this suggests that there's a magnetic field. What he then went on to do was to change the strength of the field. So what that means is he applied more or less um, voltage. And once he did that, so by changing he determined the mass to charge ratio. And he determined that to be Q of the E, which we now know to be the electron, over the mass of what we now know the, the electron to be 1.76 times 10 to the eighth coulombs per gram. So this big C here is coulombs, which is the standard unit for charge. And so one of the other things he tried was to create cathodes of different metals, because maybe 
a hypothesis they had was that different metals would give different charge to mass ratio charge to mass ratios so all of the different cathodes gave the same charge to mass ratio and this suggests that the particle is the same and so this negative particle negative low mass particle is the electron So J.J. Thompson is credited with this discovery. And so the next thing people or scientists were exceptionally cur curious about was the discovery of the charge on an electron. So instead of the charge to mass ratio, if you could discover either the mass or the charge, you could extrapolate or calculate the other. So the next scientist in our series is Robert Milliken, who's an American physicist in 1909 he conducts his now famous oil drop experiment. So the Millikan oil drop experiment is the way that scientists were able to determine the charge to mass ratio. So if we were to sketch out this device, it is a large oil type drum. And so what we have at the top is something called an atomizer. And it's going to spray oil droplets. And below that, we have a positively charged plate. Below that, we have an X-ray device. And so X-rays are going to allow the particles that fall through the positive plate to get a different charge. At the bottom, we have a negative plate. And here we actually have the ability for a scientist or others to actually watch. So this will be our eyepiece. So Robert Milliken and his students, what they did is oil droplets would be at, developed out of the atomizer. Only negatively charged particles or very small particles would fall through this plate. And once they got here, you could tune the plates. So these two plates, both the positive plate and the negative plate would be tuned to one another and you could essentially make drops hover. By getting the drops to hover in between, we can calculate the charge that is required. So if these tiny oil drops have electrons in them, which are coming from the x-rays, in this case, we're getting them to hover. You can then calculate how much charge must be applied. So Millikan and students, the x-rays give negative charges to the particles. So by adjusting the strength, he determined the charge on each particle. And so what we have here is a series of particles with perhaps slightly different charges. And so what they were able to determine is that the charges varied by whole number ratios. And so what this tells us is we can determine the charge. So Q is for charge on the electron. And that is negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And so this tells you that it has a negative charge. And so by using the charge to mass ratio decided by or discovered by J.J. Thompson, they were also able to determine that the mass of the electron is 9.10 times 10 to the negative 28 grams. So we have a very tiny negatively charged particle. And so at this point, we now know that we have an atom, 
and we have an atom that contains negatively charged particles. They were also aware that the particles were neutral. Which, so the modern atom, and we should really make a note that says at this time. And for reference, this time is approximately 1910. So not necessarily the modern atom of today, but the modern atom at the end of the Millikan oil drop experiment. So J.J. Thompson sees the results from the Millikan oil drop experiment and makes a proposition. He states that the atomic model, so the leading atomic model, was the plum. So the plum pudding model, or because I personally have never had plum pudding, but you can think of this as a chocolate chip cookie or any other component where you have kind of a sauce with large molecules inside. So the plum pudding model suggests that we have an atom. And in this atom, we have discrete negative charges. And those negative charges are surrounded Let's redraw our negative charges on top of our soup. So in this case, we have an atom with negative charges. And then we have a positive. In this case, we're going to call it a soup. So in this at atomic model, what we have are these electrons that are surrounded by a C of positive soup. We know that all of the atoms are neutral. So all atoms are neutral. Tells us that all of these neutral atoms should in fact have an equal number of positive or an equal magnitude of positive and negative charges. So this was the leading atomic model likely you are aware that this model is wrong and was not found to be the true model. In order to do that, the first thing that we needed to do was to acknowledge the discovery of radioactivity. So radioactivity is credited to three scientists, Henry Becquerel, Marie Curie, and Pierre Curie, shown over here on the right. So these three scientists won a joint Nobel Prize prior to the publication of the Millikan oil drop experiment. And so what they were able to determine is radioactivity, they discovered oop, three types. So we have alpha, beta, and gamma radioactivity. So the alpha has large positive particles. The beta, has small negative particles. And gamma radiation is neutral particles. So these three scientists discovered radioactivity. And so their radioactivity is essential for how we were able to discover the modern or the more current nuclear theory of atoms. So in 1909, so roughly the same time as the Millikan oil drop is, experiment is published, we have Rutherford. So Ernest Rutherford sets out to prove the plum pudding model. So in the experiment, what we actually see is he sets out to discover the atomic theory. So what we have is an x-ray source, or in this case, it creates alpha particles, which as a reminder, are large positively charged particles. He has a very thin sheet of gold, which we will color yellow. And then we have a detector. And so what we are doing is we are shooting these alpha particles at this thin gold sheet. So the question became, what did we expect? 
So if we use the plum pudding model, or we have an atom with, in this case, with, in this case, our small negative particles, but a C of positive. So in our expectation, we are gonna shoot these positively charged particles against a slightly positive thing. And so what we'll see is a slight deflection as opposed to something going all the way through or something being vastly repelled. So we expect a slight deflection. So in this case, we would have expected our alpha particles to just kind of move kind of a little. And so what we did not expect to see is what we actually saw. So in this case, we're gonna draw them in green. What we see is that the majority of the alpha particles go straight through the gold foil. But some of them are dramatically repealed or repelled. So if we have an atom, so this is our reality. And so what we actually find is that the majority of our alpha particles kind of just go all the way through. But some of them hit something with substantial mass and charge and are repelled. So it turns out that in this case, what we have is a dense positive center. So we have a dense positive center. And we know that because these positively charged particles are vastly repelled. So Rutherford is credited with discovering the nucleus. So we know that there were electrons, and now we know that there's a nucleus. So this gives rise to what we consider the nuclear theory. So the nuclear theory is proposed by Rutherford. And the nuclear theory is essentially this atom where most of the mass and all of the charge, so this is our dense positive center, And so what we can see in this positive charge is it's in the core, and we're gonna call that the nucleus. So most of the volume of the atom is filled with tiny negative particles. Those negative particles are what we call electrons. And so he also proposes that there are as many negative electrons outside the nucleus as positive, what we now know as protons within. So we have a charge balance. And so likely you are asking yourself, well, is this really the discovery of a proton? And no, it took Rutherford another 10 years to fully identify the proton and all of the information about it. In 1932, so another 20 years later, Chadwick discovers the neutron. And the neutron was difficult because it has no charge, even though it has similar mass to the proton. So at that point in history, we know that all atoms have a dense positive center that we call the nucleus. It's filled with protons and neutrons, and they are surrounded by tiny negatively charged particles that we call electrons.